2019, your la our last sighting of you in Greece. How are you feeling then and what were your plans? Um, yeah, I think I, I remember the gig at the Acro Acropolis was really special. Uh, and yeah, um, the ancient Greeks really know how to build a venue. <laughs> Uh, the acoustics were amazing and um, I felt, you know, the uh, it's cult of Athena in Athens and at some point an owl flew up into the rafters which everyone was very excited about. Um, so it felt like Athena was, and she's the goddess of war and handicrafts, which felt very Florence the Machine to us. It's like embroidery and a sword. And so um, it was really special actually and then of course, like me being me, as soon, literally, almost like as soon as I stepped off the stage and completed one album cycle, I started writing Dance Fever almost immediately. Um, even though, having said, I would never do it again. And but I think there's something about the um, there's something about the. It's like whenever I finish a tour, I get this. It's like all the pain of it you just forget. It's great, like, and it's like you're so high on having got through it that it propels you into making something else really quickly. It's like, I think that's a little bit one of the concepts on the album, that it feels like a possession. It feels like you commit to this thing and you get yourself through it. And then as soon as you're done, it just picks you up again. And it feels slightly out of body. And so I, um, I just started writing again um, immediately in a kind of fever, I think. It was very, it was very feverish, this, this album, the way it came on me. Isn't that sort of like maybe releasing endorphins as well? When, after you've done really extreme exercise, you can sort of feel like you could do more, even though you've pushed yourself to the limit. But that, yeah, that it, it feels like that. It's like a, it's, it is kind of a high, like you get addicted to the finishing of it and having survived it and being like, oh my God, I can't believe I got through that. That wasn't so bad. Let's do it again. Because <laughs> you just think in the middle of touring that you will never be able to do it. You're just like, I, there's no way I will survive this. Like, the better the shows, it's weird, the better the shows get, the harder it gets. And then the more open you are, the better it gets, but the more it costs you. And just over time, the shows have got better and better and better, but it just takes that more and more out of you over time. Um, but then you just forget and you're like, I need to go again. Which is a kind of madness, I think. When did the concept for Dance Fever sort of start materialising to you? Um, again, in kind of 2019. So really, as I was just tying up the last record, which seems to happen a lot, like the other, because we even did the video for Big God, and that actually feels much more like a start of the a next record. You know, it's like it was the, it feels like the start of the next chapter even that video and working with autumn um and that happens to me quite a lot uh i think on ceremonials there was a song called lover to lover and we did the video with vince and it just completely changed the whole style of the visuals and and it's almost as if as i'm going through one album cycle the next creative idea will just kind of appear um so yeah around 2019 a friend of mine told me about this sort of um, plague that had happened in the 15th and 16th centuries in Europe where people were just dancing themselves to death. And it, there was a specific one in Strasbourg where it mainly affected women and 400 women just danced themselves to death. And I just felt it so deeply because there wasn't, there was, people don't really, it's quite unexplained. It like could have been from grain that had gone off and so had a hallucinogen in it. It could have been, it could have been, I've spoken to a virologist about it and it could have been, because viruses come and go all the time, as we know <laughs> now, um, but it could have been a choreographic virus that had just died, that came and spread and then died out. But there's also, I think the thing that I related to most is that it was caused by collective stress. So that actually it's a psychological phenomenon that's, that's possible as well. and you know, it was such a hard time to live. And, and before the, cho the Choreomania, like people had been through so many other plagues, wars, complete civil unrest, like, and I just related so much to the, 
idea that you just got so stressed that all you could do was dance in the middle of the street. And I feel that way to my core. <laughs> like, I really feel that. But I also think the thing I related to the most was um, the inability to stop moving. And I related that again to my inability to stop touring of just like, what is it I'm running from? And sometimes it does feel like a death drive of like, no, it's not enough. Keep going, keep going. And like, why? What are you running from? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, before the pandemic hit, I was thinking that I would make a whole concept record about this plague. And then the pandemic hit and I went, that is way too much plague. <laughs> <laughs> just a little bit mm -hmm. is enough. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, how did it come to be that you started working with Jack? Or how did, you, how did he come into your mind as somebody you wanted to work with? Um, he, Jack had been wanting to work together for a long time, um, and... Yeah, and so what was the, you went to New York to work with him initially, was that? Um, I, uh, I, yeah, it's so funny, so we did a test, so we met in New York and also it was just like, it's also like who you get on with working a producer. Like we'd never really met before or hung out and we just started um, chatting and I just felt like we were completely on the same page of like what we wanted to do. And then we did a kind of, sometimes you just do like a play date. <laughs> like you'll just get in the studio and see what happens. And the first song we wrote was King and that was the test run. <laughs> so, that was the test run. And after a song like that happens, you're like, there's really something here. So the first songs that we wrote together were King, and then I'd come in with Corey Maynard as well, and he really helped me. Um, sorry, they come to get me. <laughs> it's time to go. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it would happen, and today's the day. Um, yeah, so the first, so King, I kind of came in and, um, King was one of those songs where I was like, oh, I can't write anything ever again. You know, like those points where I'm like, I'll never write another thing ever. I'm terrible. So dramatic. I know, <laughs> I know. I was like, I'll never write another song. And then I just sat down and wrote that song. It, it always happens that way. And then Choria Mania, again, was another song I brought to Jack to see where he could take it. And he just took it. I was just so happy with the direction and the sound. And um, so, yeah, that was really when I was like, let's, Let's do this. Let's do this whole thing together. We'll do it all in t 2020. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> you know. so how far were you into it when everything started shutting down? One week. Oh, dear. Yeah, we had one week. I got to New York in, was it March, February? End of February, March? Beginning of, yeah, end of Feb. So I got to, um, I got to, uh, New York, end of February, and uh, it was still around that time when I was asking, I was like, is it okay to go? Like, things seem bub like, what's going on? And it, people were still like, it's fine, yeah. go. And then we got one week there um, where we made free and back in town, ironically, because then I had to go home. Um, and it was crazy. It was like this, like, like I was speaking about before this, fever of energy and music and creative creativity that had come over me as soon as the last album had made it was just like completely cut off you know and it I couldn't I came home and me and Jack did we were like we'll keep this going also it was everyone was thinking it would be like a couple of months at that point you know like we'll just we'll try and keep this going for the next couple of months and then I'll see you you know it was all this no one, no one wanted to accept that this was going to be a long thing. So, you know, I went home, but we had every plan that I would be back really soon. Um, and that did not happen <laughs> at no. all. It was a year. It was a year until I saw Jack again. What were you, so what, you go back to London, what were you, what were you doing in London? <sighs> Just sitting in your screaming home. into the floor. <laughs> um, when I got back to London, I do you know what that time was so? Um, it's weird because there's so much of it that gets really hazy, but it feels like that week and like leaving New York is cr is sort of like crystal clear. But we just, I mean, basically got home. My whole family was sick, so it was just really, sca really scary. Right. 
because nobody knew. I came home and my sister and you know my niece who was three at the time and my brother and basically everyone who lived with my sister all had COVID. So first time around. Yeah, the yeah. first time around. So as soon as I landed, I would have gone to see them and my sister was like, I don't think you should come around. And we, it was just so scary. Like we didn't know, my niece was so young. And so yeah, we were just terrified. And it was the first realization, which I think I went to go and give them some stuff. And the thing that's just kind of like scarred in my brain is, you know, when we didn't know how far it could travel. And so I was standing like a street away, like delivering them some groceries. And my niece, who had COVID at the time, she like tried to run to me and my sister had to stop her. And I think that was when the human aspect of what this was gonna do to touch and to family relationships just, I think that was one of the most sort of, um, That was one of the hardest moments in the whole pandemic was just this little girl running to me and like her mum stopping her and she kind of like couldn't really figure out why. Like I was, it kind of broke me that bit. How did all this affect your writing and your, your work? Uh, it all stopped. Yeah, I, urges, yeah, yeah I couldn't, I couldn't, um, I had been in this real flow of creativity and was just writing, you know, free and back in town were written in the space with Jack of two days. Um, and then I think I couldn't write, I just cleaned, like I just cleaned all day and like, um, I think it was trying to find control over something. Um, it's just the most Virgo way to deal with things as well. <laughs> it's just like clean everything top to bottom and then start again. Um, and I did try and sit down at one point at the piano and try and write a song. And this was like a couple of months into it, I think, of like, you know, the real first one, the real hardcore lockdown, lockdown. And also when no one knew what was going on and everyone was death on in groceries. Like just like death in groceries or like you put the groceries in a room and you leave them for three days. Cause then it was like, no, like no one knew what was going on. And so, um, so then to go and write, you know, when you've been like spraying down a bag of groceries and then to go and sit down at a piano and try and write anything, you're like, <laughs> what would I even say? Um, but I also find songwriting for me, I have to go to a deeper part of myself and sort of let my subconscious take over. And if I sat down at the piano, I just started crying. There wasn't anything I could say to sum it up. There was no distance from it. Why was my point of view even fucking relevant? You know, do you know what I mean? There wasn't like, what would I have to say about it that was of any use or importance to anyone? You know, there was so, you felt so useless and helpless, I think. Um, so yeah, I remember sitting down and being like, I'm a songwriter, like I should try and write my song. And I just start crying because songwriting, you have to access your feelings. And if I tried to access it, it was just nothing but weeping, really. Um, so yeah, I just put it, I just put all writing aside. I didn't really even think about anything creative. I just concentrated on the book club, actually. Mm -hmm. That sort of got me through. Um, and we just would, I just write little reviews for books every day. And I felt, I found it easy to write about other people's work. Um, and so, yeah, I just, we just focused on between two books for a while and that kind of helped keep things ticking over. Yeah. When did you decide you needed to progress the record though? And what, at what stage? And how did you decide you wanted to do it? Well, it was like, I think when the first, um, I think when the first, when we were first able to go back into the studio, the first song I wrote was Heaven Is Here, um, which was just, because it was just, that's the sound of what's, if I'm left completely to my own devices, what happens? Which <laughs> like, just like, um, because there was no one to write with and like, it was just me in the studio and my engineer and we still were like social distancing and it was still really, you were quite deep in the pandemic. And, um, but I just, I get really, it was like, I couldn't tell what was grief at the pandemic or what was grief at not being able to work. Because for me, 
working and you know the line in my love I was always able to write my way out you know working and writing about things has kept me off the edge and so for so much of my life and has really like preserved I think my sanity in so many ways of just going it and being able to make things so I just sort of it even it just gets me out of the house like I'm not um I'm not an at-home writer like I don't have a studio in the house. I don't. F I can't sit down and just write a song at home. Like I need the physical act of like getting dressed and going to a studio to focus there. Um, if I'm at home, I could try and sit down to work, and I'm like, okay, there's a jar over there, and I think I maybe need to move it to like hundred different places in the house to see where it's supposed to live. So I'll just do that for two hours, and then I'll come back and try. Oh no, I think I maybe need to move this chair around. Like there's just I can't. The house is a project in itself, if you know what I mean. Like, it's like an ongoing installation that I live in. So that just takes over. So I have to leave the house installation to go to work. And at some point in the pandemic, I was just like, I have to get my act together. I have to like start getting dressed and go into the studio and just, I don't know what I'm gonna make, but just try something. And yeah, Heaven Is Here was actually the first thing that came out and it just felt like this clamor of I wanted to, I think it was almost like I wanted to make some kind of hex or spell or something That's what it sounds like yeah. yeah I was just like I was so I was like there was like grief and anger and frustration so it was almost like I just wanted to make some kind of um it was like a curse or something or it was also that things seemed so bad that I wanted to embody something really terrible. You know, it's kind of a horrible song. The lyrics are really horrible. So it felt like when you feel like things are so hellish, it was like, if you can't beat them, join them. You know what I mean? Like I, I just needed to go really dark at that point and just make something that was kind of terrible as, as a way to just, I don't know, process everything. When does Dave Bailey step into the picture? Oh, Dave. <laughs> Sweet Dave. Um, Frank Tope. Frank Tope. Yeah, right. Frank Tope. So really, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it was, uh, um, yeah, a really like good old friend of mine and, um, you know, uh, who originally signed me to Universal, a uh, Frank Tope. Uh, he, he, it was, he was like, oh, I think you should maybe try and, um, I think, cause I was like, could not get to Jack, like couldn't even fly there. Like, and he couldn't, um, and so the record at that point was just kind of dead. You know, there was no way to keep it going. And, um, and then I was like, oh, why don't you go in with Dave? And I'd heard of Glass Animals and they, um, and and I just, we, I was like, yeah, of course. At that point, I was like, let's try it. And um, the first song that we made when we went in there was My Love, like the very first one. Um, and then I, of course, me being me, I was like, it's like way too dancey. We'll never be, I'm enjoying this so much. Like I was dancing to it alone in my kitchen and having the best time. I was like, we can't put this on the record. <laughs> it's too good. Oh, well, I do it every time, every time. I was also when the label like something, I'm like, take it off. <laughs> like, we love this. I was like, it's gone. <laughs> um, so, but they are obviously, yeah. The first song we made was My Love um, and then I just loved working with him. I felt like um, I felt like we were both in a similar place where we needed a lot of intensity at that point and movement. And I, we both missed dancing. And Dave, you know, had been a DJ for years, so um, he basically really understands like a drop. And so it was just so fun. But again, whenever I'm making music, I never make it imagining that I'll ever use it. <laughs> like, um, but yeah, it, that was like the first song we made together. What, what are his skills, particular skills, do you think? He is, it's really interesting. Jack doesn't care about choruses. Dave really cares about choruses. 
I can go either way. So I think I'm kind of the middleman in that <laughs> thing. Um, uh, uh, which is, I think, why as a sort of production team, the three of us were quite a good unit. Jack's very, he the one, he always wants the intimacy of the vocal, so he's, he's always trying to preserve the lyrics. Um, Dave is always interested in getting people to move and the tempo, so that's really his strength is, he's like so good at making addictive music, mm -hmm. basically, um, and stuff that's danceable. Uh, and Jack, is really committed to like what the performer is saying. So, and I like, yeah, I think I need a balance of both. So I think that's kind of why it all worked. But Dave, he just, I think he's, um, Dave is really good because he also, he just wants to make stuff that's fun as well. And I really needed that. Like I really needed some fun and I really needed some euphoria. And we went in with that in mind. I was like, I just want to make something. I'm so sad. These lyrics are so sad. We need to make something really euphoric. So he's really good at that. Well, since you mentioned those, I was going to come to them later, but I mm. think the lyrics are fantastic throughout. But they are very sad or, or intense, yeah. professional, um, very direct as well. Uh, how did the process of writing those words go up, come to you? Um, <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, I think, um, yeah, I think the lyrics, do you know what, I think having written poetry really went in, back, informed the songs again. So I think trying my, trying my hand at writing some poetry, which, for whatever reason, it because you're not thinking about things rhyming and you're not thinking about strong song structure, you can think more about just phrases and things that are sharper and clearer and maybe more direct. Mm -hmm. So I think the poetry that I was writing, especially I was doing these little um, things called sermons where I would just write down anything that was in my head. And a lot of it was really weird and uh, very direct and honest. And I think having experimented with a different kind of writing, it went back and informed the songs. Mm. So it's as if I'd taken, um, it's interesting that Nick Cave says that when he writes poems, it's kind of like failed songs. But I think when I was writing poems, it was like lists of things that I just thought were too weird to put into a song, like getting kicked out of Topshop for being drunk, which doesn't sing very well, but it's funny in a poem. <laughs> <laughs> and funny in real life. <laughs> <laughs> when did you get kicked out of Topshop being together? We, <laughs> we, this was when we were first starting out as a band and it was so exciting because Topshop would dress you. We were so excited. It was like lungs, it was pre-lungs. I think this was before we'd even got signed and then when people were like, maybe let's not sign this person, <laughs> they seemed like a lunatic. But basically we had played the Cambridge Student Union Ball the night before, stayed up all night you, you know, when you got booked to play graduations, yeah. I think we'd stayed up all night and then got the train. I like jumped in the lake with all the students, so my clothes were soaked. And then I got the train and I was wearing my drummer's sports kit because that was the only dry. So, but we got the train straight to Topshop because we weren't, even though we'd had no sleep, we weren't going to let the free Topshop, like, because that's when they were dressing bands. We were like, we need to go get the free Topshop clothes. <laughs> So we all showed up. I was in my drummer's football kit, um, and everyone had like and like clanking bottles of wine <laughs> in the thing. And then the love, the sweet press people at Topshop were like, "Please, can you leave? <laughs> Please, can you leave? And you, you, you give us back the clothes? Oh. Or maybe we? I can't remember. I don't. It didn't go very well, as you can imagine. Um, but yeah, that's when we got ticked <laughs> off. Kicked out of Top Shop for drinking wine in the changing rooms, but it was it was good in a poem. But it's like you can't singing Top Shop in a song is weird. But you got Tom Beck in there. I, noticed I did get Tom Beck, but yes. I think that kind of that kind of directness and humour mm. as well. I think that you can. I felt like I could have a bit more of a. Um, I could. I felt like I could. Because I think that there's a level of humour in my life that I hadn't quite figured out how to work into songs yet. 
And I had started figuring it out in poetry. And then so then when I went back to write songs, I felt like I could bring some of that sort of more direct and, and kind of like more jokes somehow into it. Um, so yeah, it was actually, I think the writing of the poetry then informed the lyrics on this album, even though I decided like that I was a better songwriter than a poet. So I should just maybe stick to what I'm good at. But they all kind of bled into each other. It's kind of like training, I suppose, the poetry training for this. Well, yeah, yeah, it was just, it's sort of like trying to like learn a bit of a new skill or a new muscle. Um, and then kind of taking it back into sort of the songwriting. Will people recognise themselves in this record? Because there's quite a lot of stuff that feels towards people. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, it's so, it's so <laughs> oh, God. Um, uh, oh, God. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <gasps> uh, it's just so, like, the brutalness of being a songwriter. You never, I never, like, I think that that is one of the parts of songs like King and the brutality of like the mining of your own life and the people around you. I kind of never really get my head around that, but I keep doing it, you know, like there's no, it's kind of like no one is spared, um, which I think I was trying to contend with on King while doing it at the same time. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> they've stepped into your arena. But that's, that's it. Yeah. It was like, oh my god! Like everyone just goes into the grinder. Um, so you do feel kind of monstrous, I think. And I think a lot of those more horror movie references, or um, a lot of the darker aspects, is dealing with the more monstrous side of songwriting and what it takes, and that your real relationship in your life and the thing that you love the most is the songwriting. You know, and how that the people in your life have to deal with that um, and deal with kind of like being food for this monster. And it is kind of like horrific in some in some way. I think you don't. I think this idea that what you're doing is altruistic as a songwriter or you're giving something good. I think for this album, I was like, maybe it's not good. You know, but maybe it's good for you. Good for me. That's yeah, good. that's it. It's kind of the selfishness of it, I think, and really like wrestling with that a bit on this record and maybe sort of embodying a darker. Um, it's kind of like thinking that maybe songwriting, there was so much angelic uh, metaphors on the last record, and actually, like, that maybe songwriting itself is not so angelic that there is a sort of demonic energy to it you know that it's more sort of hellish than heavenly i think okay <laughs> <laughs> getting back onto the track of actually making the record yeah how did the how did it work between the three of you that mix in the production it's uh it was different <laughs> places and different weights of work and stuff yeah, this was a it was a really hard record to make actually because um, me and Jack had intended it, to do it all in one go, all together, um, and then obviously that didn't happen. And Dave came on board, and I think really my job was I'd never I've always worked with like producers, you know, who are mainly producers, like, um, and that's kind of their main job, but. Dave and Jack are both artists, and that's they they are really and both like successful touring artists as well. So I really felt like I've I think sometimes with an album, you're the um, there's like a parent child relationship, and sometimes and I've usually been the child, and so. It was my first experience of being the parent of an album, and I've just been like the only person that's going to get this finished is me. <laughs> like, because at some point Jack would be like on tour, and then Dave would be on tour, and I really felt like I was getting my kind of just desserts. I was like working with artists and getting them to finish up the boring stuff is so hard. So just kind of like like Jack would be off on tour and be like, I just need that one like vocal tweak handed in. Do you mind? Like I felt so much compassion for like Marcus and Paul who have just, you know, when you just have to get the record over the line and all the boring bits have to get done. But while you're trying to get that finished with like two artists who are doing successful tours on the side, I mean, that kind of made it 
one of the best ways to make a record, but, sorry. Um, it was kind of like one of the best ways to make a record because I loved working with them, but it also, um, with all the um, restrictions of the pandemic and, you know, I think my, I was really, um, I really was so invested in the story of the record as well. So I just needed to find all these bridges between the different sonics and that's what I become, became sort of really obsessed with. But yeah, it's interesting. Like, usually I'm the kid not wanting to hand in the boring stuff and just being like, it's done, it's finished now, bye. Like I'm off to the shops. <laughs> and then this was the first time I was like, oh, I've really got to be like the parent of this and be the boring one. Um, but it was really good. I felt like in that way that was good because at the end of it, it really felt like, um, it felt like, I've always felt, I don't know, there was something about it that I was like, I felt like I'd had almost like, like I'd really made it exactly to my specifications, if you know what I mean. Like, although it was so hard, it actually was, really satisfying in, in the end because it really felt like um, I had sort of, fo I, I don't know, I was allowed to be a sort of obsess as obsessive as I could be really because um, also because when you work with other artists they kind of get it as well mm -hmm. like uh, eat every little thing that I needed. No one was like, we, you know, why, why? No one's going to hear that. I'm like, no, no, but like, if we put this tiny bit of harp in this song, then it will echo back in that song. But like, no one will notice that. They were like, yeah, no, of course, we should do that. And they you will know? notice it. Yeah. I think, I think actually, it's <laughs> definitely the most cohesive sound I've ever made, which is weird considering how uncohesive the project was. But I mean, I'm so glad you said that because that was my, that was my work on this one was, and you know, like, just to try and get it m to sound cohesive in a time that was so fractured and all over the place. I think that was the real bulk of the work that I did. And that's why those bridges of Sonics were so important because it it was a sort of a fairy tale in the end. And I, I kind of, I guess, I didn't know what genre it was, but I think the genre that it made sense to me the most was like a short story genre where every song had its was its own little short story and the whole thing was like a collection of them. Within the dance fever, sort of as, as the overarching yeah. concept. Yeah, I think what emerged to me at the end was that it was almost a, it was kind of like a careful what you wish for fairy tale where I realized when it was finished that I had wished that I could find a way to stop the relentless drive to perform and therefore the sort of spirit of performance or whatever had gone, okay, it's gone. Like, how do you feel about it now? And then the rest of the record is just someone just begging to be let in, just being like, I'll dance forever. Just please let it come back. Please let it come back. And then it does come back. And then you have to go again. And it's like, everything is just this cycle of like, be careful what you wish for. And in the end, I didn't realize that I kind of made a fairy tale. Um, so, yeah, I'm I'm really glad that it that you think it's good because yeah, right. that was the thing I was freaking out about. Yeah, well, and it doesn't sound samey either. So it's lots of different kinds of sounds, but it all sounds like it fits together, which is maybe you haven't quite done that before in terms of the different sonics. Well, I think that was also being the no, and I think that was what because like the way that Jack works is very different to the way that Dave works. Like Jack is a minimalist at heart. Like he's. He's all about space. He's all about um, giving space to the vocal and the lyrics, which is why I wanted to work with him because I think it's also his um, engineer, Laura, is one of the best vocal engineers there is. Like, she makes vocals just sound amazing. Um, and and Dave is even more of a maximalist than me. I didn't even think I could meet someone who wants more stuff in a track. So a lot of like my, and I think a lot of a lot of my work as a producer was making sure that these two styles would work together, um, and and now I think the way the record is great is that it wouldn't be an interesting enough record without the mix of both. You know, if you had it all sparse and intimate, you would get tired of that. If it was all full, you would get tired of that. So I think actually the balance 
has turned out really well. Um, but yeah, a lot of my work was like, uh, stripping back the Dave stuff and then getting Jack to put a fucking kick drum on things. <laughs> He's like, no, no, just the lyrics. I'm like, we need a kick drum. <laughs> so it was like, it was like taking stuff off Dave and like putting stuff into the Jack stuff. <laughs> I never thought that I would be the one who was like, that's too much, but I think. Yeah. It's interesting you said that about uh, the, the vocal engineer, Laura, because yeah. your voice has got, sounds like more levels and more depth and sound to it. You sound like a much better singer as well, can I say. <laughs> yeah. is, is, do you think that's experience or is it also in the recording or is it? I think it's, I think one of the reasons I wanted to work with Jack is I think that, um, and I think Laura is maybe not even, not credited enough in the process that he always works with Laura. She's his um, engineer and she, uh, she's just one of the best vocal engineers um, out there and in terms of tone and in terms of uh, like she'll just make you sound really really great and but also uh, he's Jack's really committed to the story of a song and to not interfering with vocals um, so yeah I think really I wanted to showcase the vocal a lot on this record. Do you know what? It's also when I was young and I was training in opera, they, the singing teacher told me that I wasn't, if I was going to be an opera singer, I wouldn't actually start my career properly until my 30s. Cause it's not, that's not when your vocal cords mature at that point. And so I do think, um, I think that my vocal cords have just got stronger and have matured and I feel like I'm coming into like a more resonant style of singing. It is funny when I go back and listen to the first album and I'm singing up like sing like this. <laughs> it's like it's this crazy. Um, and so I think your vocal cords do mature in your 30s. Um, and but yeah, I think Laura and Jack and are just they're so good at vocals which is why I wanted to work with them. There's also the spoken passages as well which is new. The spoken word yeah my contribution to the South London spoken word scene <laughs> it's massive. Um, I really like the anti-singing that's going on I think there's, there's a lot of people doing anti-singing of like dry cleaning yeah. uh, and um, self-esteem and you know this sort of uh, but I think that also came from writing poetry so a lot of um, a lot of the poetry, you know, it, I think it was also, yeah, because a lot of it was like scraps of poetry, it just, it felt better to say it than sing it, I think. But yeah, it's definitely, um, there's definitely an anti-singing scene going on. <laughs> How are you going to present your work visually this time around? Um, tell, people, tell people about the um, influences behind that. Um, yeah, I again like I think it is as I was saying you sort of can find a um, you can find towards the end of a, the last record I started working with Autumn DeWild on Big God and it was kind of one of the f my favourite videos I've ever made and she was sort of the only person I'd had in mind like I, I knew it, Big God felt like the start of something rather than it was the last video of the last campaign and it's like we really need to explore this further so and Autumn's a completist, and so am I. And so we were just like, let's do everything. Um, also with this record, it is a world, like, because there was nowhere to go, the only place I had to retreat to was my imagination, which felt like I returned to maybe a style of songwriting that I hadn't really touched on since Lungs, which is this more like, um, it's more this like gothic fantasy style of writing, but with a bit more self-awareness, I would hope. Um, and so this romantic gothic style of wanting to give people that world visually was really important to me. Um, and I also just felt like after everything everyone had been through, I wanted to make something really beautiful that people could escape into that I think being able to process grief, but in an environment that has an element of fantasy to it, it provides people a sort of a space to process their emotions, but which they're 
held. Mm. Um, and I, I needed that, and I thought maybe people would need that too. So creating an entire world for the record was always really important. Well, I've not seen the artwork. Describe that to me if you can, please. Um, me, me and Autumn, we looked a lot at Edwardian portraiture. I think it was, I wanted something with an edge of darkness to it. And a lot of the imagery is, is kind of funereal and there is a sense of uh, glamour, but that's very bedraggled, you know, as if something crawled. It's as if like something crawled into a dre into a hole in a dress and then kind of like crawled out. I guess, <laughs> I guess I was also playing on the idea of like, um, I think when you get into your mid thirties and you still don't like have a family or you haven't done the traditional thing, there's this sort of like, an air of tragedy that's, that people start to project onto you. And I think I really wanted to lean into that very strongly. <laughs> I was like, I was like, okay, Mish Habersham, let's go further into that. So I think there was this sense of um, wanting to lean into these sort of tragic mythologies. And um, so everything has this slightly like, Edwardian Miss Habersham vibe uh, that I that yeah that was something that um, I was like if they're gonna think this about me anyway I'm just gonna go full <laughs> full out. <laughs> How is this gonna bleed into your um, live show into your set design etc? We have actually looked a lot of Miss Habersham's feast. <laughs> You know, the tables that are covered in... Because I do think people think in my spare time I'm sitting in the house crying in a wedding dress. <laughs> and who's to say I'm not? <laughs> Who is to say that I'm not? Um, <laughs> I really wanted to do... Everyone was trying to get me to do TikToks. And I was like, the only way I'll do a TikTok if I can do a day in a life. And it's just sped up footage of me like drinking fake blood and crying in a wedding dress. We haven't got that made yet, but we, <laughs> we might do. Because <laughs> they're like, and this is what I, people will be like, yeah, I mean, it makes complete sense. <laughs> so <laughs> I think we're just going further with that. Um, <laughs> so yeah, one of our references is um, Miss Havisham's Feast, which is like, you know, the candles that are all covered yeah. in spider webs. And so yeah, I think again, it's, m it's leaning into these sort of, um, this w lace was a very big reference for us. And uh, <laughs> everyone's like, you're making it worse. <laughs> but it was like, you know, uh, but this idea of raggedness and beauty that has been bedraggled and broken. And I do think this idea of like, after everything that has been through, you know, you cannot help but be a different creature on the other side, something slightly more cracked. And I don't, I don't know if I could afford to get a bit, I don't know if I could afford to get more cracked, but it happened. And I think we wanted to represent that somehow. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> Are you prepared for the Maximum Florence live 18 months, two years of this again? Will I be meeting you in 18 months? I know. Austin, Do you know what, it's so funny. I was like, I worried that the therapy I'm having is not working. Like, <laughs> um, because I remember us doing an interview. I feel like I do the same interviews because I remember, but this was before I stopped drinking. It's this weird thing of like, I think this album especially was a recognition of like, my, even though I don't drink anymore, my brain somehow remains the same, which is that, because I remember, I think one of the first stories we did together, you came out to see me on a tour in Seattle. Yes. Yes. And I was like, I'm never happy except when I'm on stage. And then everywhere else, I'm completely depressed. Yeah. And like, you, uh, were, you cried during the interview. Did I cry? You were shellfish. Oh. And you were crying, and it, you were crying onto your bib. <laughs> <laughs> this may not be interesting. But I feel, like, but I, <laughs> 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 I know, Germany needs it. <laughs> but it's really interesting to kind of be like, because I still say similar stuff, and I'm like, when does it end? And like, I think that is like, and so this, this thing of like, touring is hard, but the stage is amazing. And that is the thing of like, that's the pay, that's the sort of 
the Faustian thing, I guess, and that the worse that your life gets on the tour, the better the performances become. And so, yeah, it's this kind of, um, to be honest, like I, um, I, when the pandemic was really happening and no one knew when it would end and no one, there was, it's, I feel like it's really easy to be like, oh, of course gigs came back and life has, but I think there were months there when like nobody really knew. Um, and me being dramatic, you know, I just was like, it could be just gone. And I think it was such a profound feeling of loss of the space where I felt like I had meaning in my life that I just went, I'll do anything to, if touring comes back, I'll tour forever. See if I'm still grateful for it in like, a, in like a year's time, but I don't know, I also like just came to terms with, I think our, even before the pandemic hit, when the last record stopped, I was just like, why would I stop doing this? This is what I'm good at. This is actually just really what I'm good at, especially live performances. Like making an album's hard. So it's really, really hard. I don't know, you never think that you've got it right. You just, you're making an album, you have to abandon it. You can't finish it. You just have to be like, oh, okay, I guess it's done. But with a live performance, it's, it's felt like the only thing I've ever been sure of. Even though it's hard, it felt like it's what I was built for. Um, and so at the end of the last record, even though it was so hard, I just went, you know what, this is what I'm really good at and why would I stop doing Those that? Last, last dates you were doing were so good as well. There's no, there's no, you couldn't stop doing that. that I was just like, I think this is what I'm meant to do. It's what I'm meant to do with my life. This is why I've been put on the earth in all the things that make my daily life hard uh, with this kind of brain, for some reason they all work really well on the stage and why would I take away the one place that makes sense to me? And so when I, the irony of kind of committing to that again and then it being taken away or wondering if it would come back was, was so acute. Um, but yeah, it's, it's grueling and I think whenever you have come to see me on tour, I've always been like, I've never been so unhappy. <laughs> and I was thinking about that. I was like, oh my God, Tez just seems like every time we're like, I've never been so unhappy. <laughs> I'm like, I'll never do this again. And then we, he's like, hey, so we're back again. <laughs> like, back again, another tour. Yeah. But I think that's just the, I think Phoebe Bridges did a tweet in the, there's someone to hold me about, I don't have a Twitter. Um, and she was like, I can't wait to complain about being on tour again. Yeah. And it is that feeling like I can't wait to be out there being like, I will never do this again. But there's just nothing, there's nothing in my life I've ever been as sure of that I can do, you know. Um, and I'm, I've honestly like missed every, I like, I miss, the, I miss them. I miss the, um, I was thinking about the, um, but I was thinking about this funny thing. I was like, God, I just feel so like at peace on stage. I was like, why do you feel so at peace when you're the center, <laughs> absolute center of attention? I'm like, it's the only place that makes sense. I was like, you could never, you could not be more center of attention. Like, ah, oh, everything makes sense. I was like, that's a crazy way There's to. Thirty thousand people like, here, and they're all looking. Yeah, at me. exactly. Everyone is looking at me. I can finally relax. <laughs> like, what is going on? But I do feel in a way, although everyone's looking at you, it's a transcendence of self because it becomes, it's a, such a strange thing because although it's all about you, it becomes about everyone's experience there and it becomes about the song and the room. And there are moments when my head is relentless. It's like there's a podcast in my head that will not shut up all day, every day. And it's like, there's the, I'm gonna have be tested on I don't know, everything that's happening all the time and if I don't have the right answer, so I need to like create, I don't know, I'm always analyzing and making, as, it, as if I'm making like speeches all day in my head and it won't shut up. Um, but when I get on stage, everything is quiet. Everything is quiet. And it's that moment of connection. And I just, I miss having that with people. I miss like, and it's not even, I don't know, I, it's not even thinking of them as like an audience or fans. It's like I miss having that with people in a room and everyone being together in that moment. Um, so yeah, that 
I, again, there's been so many fits and starts with performance itself. So I still, ha at this point when we're doing this interview, I haven't got back to my first real gig. Mm -hmm. And I haven't been able to believe that it will happen. So I, I, it's kind of like, I don't know, when I actually get out onto that stage, I think I just have to try not to cry all the way through. <laughs> it's going to happen. I know. <laughs> um, I'm not sure how much time we've got left, mm. but let's talk, because I don't think we have time to do a track mm. by track, but we will have time to do talk about the singles and all yeah. the tracks we're putting out. So let's talk about King. I know we've spoken about King a little bit already, but um, I'm no mother, I'm no bride, I'm King. Tell us where this comes from and tell us a little about the, the backstory of the song. Um, this song was written, um, it's one of those songs that kind of like fall from the sky when you can't, you think you can't write. I was like, I'm never going to write another song. I can't write, I've got no, I've got no, I've got no inspiration. I think it was written around 2019. Um, and it was that thing again, I was, you know, after Hires Hope, I had decided that I would stop and like maybe I would then, you know, it's like time is ticking, especially in your 30s. Um, from the, if you're like, it, when you're a woman, everyone just like hammers into you, like 35 to 40, like you have this window, don't lose the window. And, but it's really hard to imagine like how little you think about it until it actually happens. It's like, no, 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 that's fine. But I'd come off Hires Hope and, it, you know, there was this window to have a family and I was off starting another record and thinking about booking another tour. And I was just like, why am I doing this? Like, when is it going to kick in that I'm going to really know that I'm ready for a family and I'm ready to settle down? And like, what is it in me that the performer just takes over and and you know again like the brutal like we're talking about the brutality of songwriting it's just like nope off you go again so i think it would be a simplica simplification of that song to think it's this rejection of these archetypes and that i don't want those things but actually the core of the song is the confusion of like i do want those things i want to have a family um and I also want to be the best performer that I can be. And just for me, those feel really at odds with each other, uh, especially how bodily my performances are. And if I was going to carry a child, that's a huge bodily commitment. And yet my tours, for me, are an enormous bodily commitment. So I did just feel the splitting of two really powerful desires. And again, it feels like the song just comes in with its sword and cuts everything else down. It's just like, nope, you're going. And I wonder, I was wondering as well if that was just a commitment that I have to my own unhappiness and to my own loneliness. Because it's like the stage is the salvation, but it's also the place that takes you away from family and takes you away from friends and in some senses keeps you really isolated. So a lot of this record is like analyzing how committed to my, I am to my own sense of but being a tragic figure. I mean, like, are you? choosing this to perpetuate the tragedy um but we'll see <laughs> mm. so there's no resi you haven't found resolution through it or? it feels like you should have a kid just to get it out of the way but it feels like a really wrong reason to do it do you know what i mean it's, it's like it's but it's also just like so that you don't have to it feels like do it so that you don't have to talk about it anymore which feels like but that feels like a really wrong reason to do it um I haven't come to a resolution with it, I think. I think the question is still, um, but now it feels more like a kind of, sort of does feel like you're haunted by something, I think, especially at this age, you're like, which is really frustrating, because it's like, I think the scream at the end is, I'm really good at feeling like I'm failing at something, and even when I'm doing really, I feel like I have made some of the best music at my career, suddenly when I hit 35, I was like, oh, but I'm failing at this. And it was a real fight for me to be like, no, don't buy into that. Like, don't, please don't buy into that narrative of like choosing another thing that you can feel like you're not getting right. Mm. So I think that's the fight there. And that's this kind of scream at the end of King mm. um, because it just suddenly creeps up on you like that. I didn't even really think about it until I hit 35. And I was like, oh fuck, I turned 35. I'm supposed to do something. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I 
I can't offer you any advice. Or, or, no or one can. That. No one can offer it apart from the people with kids who are like, I've never been so tired. You should do <laughs> it. It's hell. You should do it. Like everyone with kids is like, it's a nightmare. Have one. Fair <laughs> <laughs> <Sweet laughs> <better> summary. <laughs> um, that, free picks me, that, that feels like the key lyric to the album. But, uh, when I'm dancing, I am free. Yeah. Um, For a moment when I'm dancing, I'm free. No, it really is the... Um, because that's what I'm, it's kind of the, yeah, with Free, it's like, I was really struggling with, um, it's interesting, I feel like the last record was really like, sobriety has made me better, things are getting better, and then this record is very much, oh, it really doesn't fix everything, you know, you have to contend with who you really are, and for me, I think a lot of that is like really, um, like bad mental health stuff and even without hangovers or I was like oh this is just what I'm like like this isn't even because of alcohol or drugs like this is just the head I have yeah Jesus you know <laughs> like um and I think really I can get you know I can get pretty existential pretty fast you know if I'm going down I'm going really down and being like what is the point and actually, to me, where I've always found meaning and where I feel most free is dancing and music and seeing people perform. And it's where I kind of, where I see so much love, I think. And it's where I really think people are at their best as well, when they're in that moment of dancing and freedom from self-consciousness and unafraid and beautiful. And so I think that was, it's this crux of like, it's so weird. The whole record is like, is it a chicken or the egg thing? You know, am I anxious because I have a stressful career or is it actually that the career is the only thing saving me from the anxiety because I get to make this work and dance, but, and sing and make art, which saves me so many times over. Um, but then it comes with this side of scrutiny that I really struggle with. Um, and I think, just before I made this record, a lot of the things that I went through when I was younger and maybe drank through, you know, the scrutiny of getting famous when you're young, when you're young, kind of came back to bite me. Maybe I was ready, maybe I was like old enough to try and process it, but I was having a lot of panic attacks and really, really bad um, anxiety. And I think it was just maybe stuff from being young and not processing it that was just kind of coming up. And that song was about that um, and that actually I would go but the thing that would get me through it was I would go and I would listen to music and I would run really fast or dance around and for a moment I would be free you know and it was just sort of I wanted to make a song of being grateful for that feeling mm. great my love yeah this is the last. tell us a little bit of that um, my Love was a poem that was written, I think, it was the first thing that I wrote after a long period of writer's block where I couldn't write anything. Um, and I had, I just sort of sat down and again, it was about, the only place that has ever really made sense to me is performance or the stage. And I've always had such big feelings that feel unwieldy in daily life and feel like not socially acceptable and you know and yeah on stage they are really useful and so it was this idea of like what would I, if that all goes away if performance and live music goes away where will I put these feelings I don't have any place mm. for them and it was also just this grief of not being able to hug or embrace my family and friends and I just felt like I had these, this love that there now I didn't know where to put in the world. And it would have been an incredibly sad poem and stayed that way had I not met Dave Bailey. And he just flipped it and turned it into an absolutely euphoric dance track that really I think, again, for me, like dancing and movement is a huge way of processing um, anxiety and, and pain and it was kind of the perfect thing to do with it because you could cry and dance at the same time. <laughs>
to it. Which I did a lot alone in my kitchen. I just danced and cried to it because it, it's, it brings energy back to the feeling, you know, so you don't just have to sit there in your sadness, like you can move through it. Mm. And I think for me, moving through my emotions, like movement is a kind of magic to me. Like I can, if I can move through it, then it, it, it's like I can process it better. Yeah. Florence, tremendous talking to you. So I nice to talk to you again. <laughs> You'll have to come and see me on tour and I see if it's definitely. any different. Of course, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No